So um, I will be sharing with you God's word, and I just have a, a couple of things as we get started. Uh, just thinking about missions, and, and we can go ahead and put the slide up there. Kind of the question for the day is, what is the mission? And we're going to be looking at Luke 4, 7, 9, 10, and 24. Don't worry, we're not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to look at some snapshots of each of those. So if you want to turn there now, that's great. Um, but, and, and you don't necessarily have to raise your hand, but how many of you have been a part of a mission trip, a service project, or it could even be something with work where you're a part of a team that had to come together and, and, and work to complete some goal or mission. Uh, and, and then the follow-up to that, though, is when you're on one of those teams, say you go on a mission trip, do you just do a lot of sitting around doing nothing? I hear some laughter. <laughs> Not typically, right? You're, you're put out there to serve and, and, and to work, and maybe you get your hands a little dirty, and, and that's part of the process. And, and maybe if it's not manual labor, it's just going and sharing your heart with others. It, it's proclaiming the gospel. And, and, and so when we think about that, uh, how do we know whether the mission is actually happening? How do we know if it's effective? And if everybody shows up to the planning meeting, does that make it effective? No, it can help, right? Some of you that lead some of our teams, it's nice when you have everybody there, right? If everybody knows the itinerary, does that make it effective? Eh, it, it, once again, it can help. What about if everybody just goes off and does their own thing? No, not likely, right? So, so how do you gauge that? It's, is the mission actually happening? If you go to build a house and start a bonfire instead... Is that effective? No, but if that house gets built, man, high fives all around, right? <laughs> yeah, I've actually done Habitat for Humanity and I did roofing. That was an experience. That was a steeper grade than I want to be on ever again <laughs> for roof. Um, yeah, so I, I want to look at a few passages today, these passages in Luke, and just ask those questions. What is the mission? Is it happening? And so John spoke last week on John chapter 3, verse 16, familiar passage. And he talked about how Jesus is the greatest missionary. God the Father is the sender, and Jesus is the one who is sent. And, and throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus wasn't really what the people expected. That the Jews were looking for some political hero that could come and free them from Rome. And the, the Romans kind of really didn't think there was a whole lot to Jesus, really. They didn't think he had really done enough to deserve death, but they also, he was just kind of like, who's this, this, just some Jewish guy over here. But those who experienced his loving grace, what do they think of Jesus? I think you know the answer to that question. So, so as a church, we just finished up, and I think John shared, he, went, he did 70 sermons on Acts. So we saw how the mission continued after Jesus, right? We saw that mission continuing through the early church, through the disciples. And Luke is the writer of Acts, and he saw the mission, didn't he? And through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, it was like, this needs to be written down. This needs to be written down. We need to know how the story continued. So, so we see in Acts, the disciples, uh, Peter and John were kind of like, key people early on. And then you see Stephen and Philip, who were the ones chosen in uh, Acts chapter 6 that became some key figures for a couple of chapters. And then you got this, this guy named Paul, who became central to the whole second half of the book of Acts. But, but, but how did it start? Why did Acts come about? Where did the mission begin? And we can actually go all the way back to the Old Testament. We can see that the, the people of Israel were God's chosen instrument to be a light to the world, his chosen nation. But that wasn't fully realized until God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And, and so through Jesus, that became a reality. And, and Luke's gospel talks about this. And we're going to bounce through, kind of like I said, bounce through Luke a little bit, asking those two questions. What was the mission? Was it happening? We're eventually going to get to the questions, what is the mission, and is it happening? So let's pray before we dive into God's Word. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for the Word made flesh to dwell among us, 
so that we may have the opportunity to respond to your loving grace, so that we may uh, have salvation, so that we may have freedom, and so that it, it may extend to others. Lord, as we read your word, read our hearts, and draw us into your presence, and may we hear from you today and be encouraged and challenged and leave rejoicing because you are good and your love endures forever. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Luke 4 is where we're going to end up in just a minute. So the story uh, unfolds in Luke's gospel. We have the birth of John the Baptist, the birth of Jesus, and, and then you have where at, at Jesus' baptism, when John is baptizing him, God says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And I think it's really important for us to start there because the mission of Jesus hadn't really begun, right? His public ministry had not started. And what was God? Already well pleased. And it's all about God's love for the son that led to the mission of him loving us to die for us. But it's true for us today too. If we try to start by doing the work, we've already missed the point. But if we start with the love of God and his love is able to flow through us, that's when the mission is effective. That's when that mission is really happening. So Luke chapter 4, uh, Jesus has just uh, been out in the wilderness after his baptism, and he was tempted. And then we get to verse 14. That's where we're going to pick up today. The Spirit of the Lord was on him. He went out into the desert, was tempted, and now verse 14. And I'm bouncing around too, so if I ever kind of lose my place, y'all just help me out, okay? Because in the first service, I was like, wait, what verse was I on? Um, okay, verse 14, chapter 4 of Luke. Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. And this may sound familiar because Derek read this from Isaiah earlier. And Jesus is quoting that. He's reading what was the synagogue reading of the day. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, today as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. So what was Jesus' mission? What do we have? Preach the good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the, plot, to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Does anyone know what the year of the Lord's favor is equivalent to in this passage? Anybody ever heard the, of the year of Jubilee? Ever, so the year of Jubilee was something that the, the Jews, I don't know if they ever really did it the way they were supposed to, but it was a year that any slaves were to be set free and all debts were to be canceled. Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand, but you kind of wish all debts would be canceled this year? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so so that, that's kind of the context of this. And, and Jesus is saying, this is the year of the Lord's favor. This is the year of freedom. So his message and, and part of his mission was to set free. It was to set people free from the bondage of sin, from sickness, from Satan, and from death. Setting free. So that's the mission. Was it happening? We know the answer is yes. But let's turn to Luke 7. We're going to pick up in verse 18. So then John's disciples, John the Baptist, told him about all these things. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord, asking, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Okay, so it's interesting that John is doubting Jesus at this point. Because 
Who baptized Jesus? John the Baptist. It, was he sure that Jesus was the one at the time? Yeah, he, he knew that when the Spirit descended upon Jesus, uh, on Jesus like a dove, it was like, this is the guy. This is the one. Why would he doubt now? Why is he asking this question? Does anyone know where John is at this point? He's in prison. He's, in, in, he's discouraged. John was the center of the revival ministry of the Israels. He was calling them to repentance. He was baptizing them. But now he's in prison. He's the one that said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew Jesus was the one. But now in prison, he's discouraged. He's away from the action. He's not seeing what's going on. His reports are limited. But then he hears this report from some of his disciples. And he says, look... Go, ask, are you the one or should we expect someone else? And, and I think it's important for us. Anybody here get discouraged or doubt or fear? Maybe you're where John the Baptist was. I think it's important that we ask that same question that John the Baptist was asking. Jesus, are you the one? When we ask the question, Jesus, are you the one, and we're seeking the truth, we're going to find the answer that he is the way and the truth and the life, and we can have freedom in Christ. So John asks, and we can pick up in verse 20. When the men reached him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that time, Jesus healed many people of diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits, and he granted sight to many blind people. He replied to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor are told the good news, and blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. Was the mission happening? Yes, it was. Jesus was setting people free, free from blindness. He was setting them free to walk, free from the unwelcoming disease of leprosy, free, free to hear, free to live, and free to believe in the riches of heaven. What was the mission? Set free. Was it happening? Yes. Did it stop there? No. We can turn to, what is, oh, it's not on screen. Luke chapter um, 9. So, so Jesus was raising up a team of freedom fighters. He was raising up, oh, there you go. So we talked about Jesus, now we're going to be on the 12th. So Jesus was raising up disciples who would be freedom fighters, not fighting with the weapons of this world, but fighting against the spiritual forces of evil. Jesus knew his time on earth was short, and even Jesus couldn't carry out his work in his flesh. He had to rely on his Father and on the Spirit and he knows that his followers can't do it in their flesh. Like, if I can't do it in my flesh and I'm the son of God, I know that they need more than themselves. So let's look at Luke 9, verse 1. Summoning the twelve, he gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. <clears throat> Then he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Take nothing for the road, he told them. No staff, no traveling bag, no bread, no money. Don't even take an extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. If they do not welcome you, when you leave that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. We're going to stop there. Okay, so he sent out the 12, knowing they had no power of their own. So what did he do? He gave them his power and authority. He passed it on to them so that they could go out in his power, not their own. They couldn't rely on themselves. They had to rely completely on him, and they could take nothing with them. Sound fun? Not really. Doesn't sound that way. I think it's interesting that the first thing he mentions is take no staff. How about these guys? What, what, what heritage did they have? What nationality were they? They were Jews. Name some of their heroes. David, Moses, Abraham. So we're going to key in on Moses. Moses was sent on a mission to free the people of Israel. What do you have with him? 
a staff. Jesus says, take no staff. What was the staff used for when Moses took it? Part the Red Sea, strike a rock and water comes out, go before Pharaoh, and it show his power. Don't take a staff with you. But, 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 but Jesus, Moses had a staff. I'm the staff for the healing of the nations now, Jesus says. You don't need that. You need me. But then no bag, no food, no money, no extra clothes, just power and authority. Is that how you want to go out? <laughs> like you want to say yes, but you're like, no. <laughs> it, so Ashley was just sharing this with me the other day. Uh, about 11 years ago, our oldest was a young and he was about one. And we kind of stepped out on faith. and We didn't have a whole lot. And she said at some point, she was like, I'm just going to take Makai and we're going to go stay with my parents for a while. And her reason was, she said, I thought we were just going to end up in an alley somewhere. But we didn't. God took care of us and he provided. I don't even think I knew that story until this week when I was telling her what I was talking about. Um, stay where you're le welcome, leave where you're not, just shake the dust off your feet when you leave those. Okay, I could get into this passage more, but what, what, what was the mission? What, what was Jesus sending them out to do? Proclaim the kingdom and heal, right? So let's see, was it happening? Where, where were we? Verse 6? Is that right? I think. I told you all you are got to help me out. Okay, so they went out and traveled from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing everywhere. Is that Jesus? No, that's the twelve. Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about everything that was going on. He was perplexed because some said that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead, some that Elijah had appeared, and others that one of the ancient prophets had risen. I beheaded John, Herod said, but who is this I hear such things about? And he wanted to see him. And the apostles returned. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus all that they had done. And he took them along and withdrew privately to a town called Bethsaida. Was it happening? You bet. It, healing and proclaiming, or proclaiming the good news and healing everywhere. And then when Herod got word of what was going on, he's like, I beheaded John. So, okay, last time we skipped a bunch, and then John's in prison. This time we skipped a bunch, and now John's beheaded. So John was the one that was getting the attention of Herod at one point. And, and then John was in prison, and God's kingdom accelerated. Now John has been beheaded, and it's multiplying. And Herod's like, I want to meet this guy, this Jesus. Here's the thing. What ministry got Herod's attention? Was it Jesus's or the 12? The text seems to imply that it was the 12. And Herod's like, I want to meet Jesus. So, so whose power and authority was it? Not the 12, right? It was Jesus. That's why you want to meet Jesus. It's all in the power and authority that Jesus gave them. So we're going to flip down to uh, chapter 10 because did the mission stop there? Nah. No. Jesus fed the 5,000. And we look at the rest of chapter 9. He cast out demons. He healed. He started preparing his followers for his death and departure. And then chapter 10. And I'm going to kind of skip around even more in chapter 10. Um, I'm going to read a few parts and skip some. So just bear with me. After this, wait, I'm on the right page. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and he sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. He told them, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't take money bag, traveling bag. And he kind of gets into some of the same type stuff as before, a little bit more detail in some ways. But then if we skip down to verse 9, that's where I want to go to. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. And he goes on to tell a little bit more, but that's kind of the point right there. Is, uh, so Jesus, Jesus was doing it himself. He sent out the 12. They were doing it. Now he's sending out 72 others. And he's sending them to towns he hasn't even been to yet. So kind of like with John the Baptist, they're preparing the way for Jesus' ministry in those towns. And then verse 2, he said, 
The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So I have an interesting little story to tell you about this. Interesting in my mind. You may not find it as interesting. I don't know. We'll see. So I was challenged a number of years ago to pray this prayer at 10.02 every day because it's Luke 10.2. And so at 10.02 a.m., p.m., pray this prayer that the Lord would send out workers into the harvest. And so I, for a while, I had a, an alarm on my phone that would go off and remind me. Then I kind of got in the habit. I don't do it all the time now. But if I see the clock at 10.02, I try to remember to pray this. So as I was studying this this week, I was in my office, and I read this, and I look at the clock. Guess what time it was? 10.02. So, so for my computer to say 10.02, that's fine. For my phone to also say 10.02, kind of expected. Ashley can attest that I have no clock other than those that are controlled by satellite or whatever that stays at the right time. The clock by my bed, and my kids can attest to this too, is always speeding up. My watch, not the one I'm wearing right now, it's pretty accurate, but my other watch, it speeds up. It's always fast. What time was it? 10.02. It matched up. We're not done. There used to be a clock right above that exit sign back there. We took it down. Do you know why? It kept horrible time. It was always slow. It's in my office now. I think that's thanks to Watson, but I'm not positive about that. But someone stuck it in my office, and here's the thing. I didn't get rid of it. I put it up on my shelf, knowing that it's always slow. You can probably see where this is going. Guess what time it was? 10.02. A fast watch, a slow clock. The computer and my phone, 10.02. You think God has perfect timing? I think we question that sometimes? Yeah. So, so that's my little story of this week. But that prayer, excitingly dangerous. Because you know what? When those disciples prayed that, what happened next? Verse 3, go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Does that sound fun? Did they go anyways? Yeah. So what was the message, or what was the mission that they were to go on? To do what? Verse 9. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Let's pick up in verse 17. See if it was happening. The 72 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing at all will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And at that time, he, Jesus, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure. And he goes on. Um, I hesitate to do this. I did in the first service, but I got to do it again. Um, John's not here. He's not all into snakes and scorpions. So, Derek, if you'll go ahead and bring up those snakes and scorpions. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just had to do that. Sorry, I, that's cheesy, I'm sorry, but it was just fun. We're not doing that, we're not doing that. What's the mission happening? Yeah, they came back rejoicing that even the demons submitted to them, right? What's the common theme here between Jesus, the 12, and the 72? What did they go out to do? Heal, proclaim the kingdom, set people free free from the bondage of sin, free from the tyranny of the world systems, free from the tyranny of Satan. Is this word still relevant today? We need some freedom from tyranny? Yeah. It's not Putin. You know that, right? Who's the tyrant? Satan. It's relevant because that charity may be in your heart and your mind right now. Forget what's going on in the world. You know what you're experiencing. 
Say, Jesus, are you the one? Because you can't expect anyone else. But how does Jesus respond to their joy of the demons submitting to them? Yeah, go get them. No? Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven because Jesus is calling us to another freedom, a freedom to live with him for all eternity, a freedom from the bondage of hell, a freedom to have new life in Christ. That's what we celebrate. Not, I mean, what we do on I don't think Jesus is saying, don't celebrate that you have power in me. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, celebrate that you can be with me for eternity. So, so then, it, did the mission end there? No, Jesus was later arrested. He was beaten. He was hung on a cross, and he died for our sins. I could go into that, but we're just kind of, I hate to gloss over that, but that's what happened. When he died, did the mission end there? No. What happened? He rose again. So, so then uh, we can, it, it kind of looked like the mission was over, but, but we know that it wasn't. He rose again. We can see that in Luke 24. Uh, you can go ahead and flip over to Luke 24. We're going to land in verse 44, but at the beginning of that chapter, when some of his followers went to the tomb, they saw two men in dazzling clothes, and they said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And he, said, he is not here, but he is risen. And he talked about how he had said he was going to do this. He did it. They remembered his words. And then let's get down to verse 44. So, no, I didn't go far enough. Luke 24, verse 44. This is the end of Luke's gospel. And this is where we get to us. He told them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he also said to them, This is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and and repentance of forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and look, I am sending you what my Father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you receive until you are empowered from on high. Then he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, lifting up his hands. He blessed them, and while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. And worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising God. So Jesus basically says, I told you so. (laughs) I told you all the law and the prophets and all those things that were pointing to me and what I was going to do. You were looking for an earthly king that could set you free, but I'm an eternal king that will set you free forever. And then we can look at uh, Luke's other writing in Acts, in Acts 1.8, and it gives us a little bit more understanding of what he's talking about here. And he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He says, wait, but wait, wait for the Spirit. Do the disciples want Jesus to die? No, they didn't know what was going to happen next. When he rose again, did they want him to leave? Not at first, but at this point, how do they respond when he's going or when he's already ascended? They worship. And he said, but, but wait, so, so now they're ready to keep the mission going, and they're like, Let's go. He's like, no, no, no. Wait, you can't do this on your own. You need me. You need my Holy Spirit to guide you. So wait. God's power and God's timing. So I have some questions. We can go ahead and put those up on the screen. What was the mission? Freedom. To set people free from sin and Satan and death. And we can look and see like, okay, Jesus wanted to save us. Jesus' mission was to save us and make disciples. Salvation is that freedom to have an eternal life. But you know what? Sometimes we just still live hell on earth. And we need to be set free from that. That's what that process of discipleship is all about. Sanctification. Being set free from the bondage of Satan now. 
And when we're set free from that and we're freed into a, a life of peace and joy, then the world will want to know. They'll want to know because we'll be living a proclamation of the kingdom. And when they want to know, we can tell them it's Jesus. So why? Because God loves us. It, Jesus wants us to be in a relationship with him for all eternity. Who is Jesus to the world, to his disciples, to us? And it's then, it's now, it's always, it's wherever Jesus is leading, wherever he's leading his disciples, wherever we go, if we're representing him, and we can only do it in his way, through the power, authority, and love of the Holy Spirit. So the mission is freedom in Christ. True love came on a mission, and that mission continues. It's not over. It, it, it remains today. The Son sent the, or, or the Father sent the Son, the Son sent the Spirit so that we may continue the mission. And, and I could challenge you today to join the mission, but I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to leave that for John next week. Today, I'm just going to tell you about, and is it happening? Our mission to make disciples who exalt, encourage, engage. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But, but, but I could close with some thoughts. And I could tell you of the millions of Muslims that are coming to faith in Christ in the Middle East. Or I could tell you about the thousands upon thousands of Jews that are recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. I, I, I could tell you about Bibles flying off the shelves in Ukraine because people want to know the truth and righteousness. I, I, I could tell you about pockets of revival and movements of faith in North America, South America, and Africa. I'm not even going to go there today. I just kind of did. But. I want to tell you just what's happening through our community of faith. It, what's happening through those we're connected with. It, through those that we support and partner with locally, nationally, and globally. Are there things that we could be better at? Yeah. Are there things that we could improve in? Are there, are there ways that we could exalt and encourage better? Yeah. Are there ways that we can engage better? Yes. And what I'm going to tell you is not about puffing us up. It's just going, I'm, I'm just going to shed some light on how God is using this little church in Lawrenceville, Georgia to impact the world. So we have Family Promise, our annual health fair. There's Hope for the Hungry in Lawrenceville Co-op locally. People are being set free from having to sleep in their cars. They're free from being bedless. We're helping to provide a place. People are being set free from toothaches through the health fair, through the dental fair. And, and that might not sound like a whole lot, but you get a toothache and you'll realize that's a lot. But, but also they're being set free from it, it, medical expenses that they wouldn't be able to afford over 75 families, actually I think it's like 75 individuals or so per year at the dental fair, but also about 75 families a month have more food on the table than they would have through the co-op and there's hope for the hungry. People are being set free from hunger, Just being set free from the worry of, am I going to be able to put food on the table for my family? That's all good. But you know what we can really rejoice about? If I can spit it out. Is that over 100 names that have been added to the scrolls of heaven through those ministries. Yeah, that's fine. It's not about us. It's about what God is doing through his people. How about nationally? Uh, through Mike McCoy Ministries, Catholic school students are able to hear the fullness of the gospel. There's so much despair and anxiety, and he's offering them hope and life. And we have college students hearing the gospel and developing relationships with Christ followers who are offering the love of Jesus. We have couples and pastors and missionaries who are being encouraged. There's freedom from religious ritual. There's freedom from stress and anxiety and freedom to serve. And then we can go globally, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, hearing the loving truth of Jesus Christ 
church planters being trained and sent out, believers learning how to share the gospel with their neighbors, athletes and coaches being exposed to the truth and love, the hungry are being fed, the illiterate are learning to read their Bibles. Children are hearing the gospel and seeing example of godly Christian men and women. Freedom from false religion, freedom from fear, freedom from hunger and hopelessness all over the world. And I have a few pictures. A couple of them can go on live stream. I can't remember what we decided exactly, but some of these will not even be able to go out on live stream. This is Peru. If you're familiar with Pablo, down there in the bottom right, Pablo and Kuz here are the ones we support. They have three little kids down in Peru. And they visited with us a few times. Uh, go, go back to the first slide, sorry. Uh, see that little red device that the guy's holding next to Pablo? That's an audio Bible that also has other uh, audio resources to be able to share the gospel. These are people that cannot read that are hearing the gospel in their language. You get to the next slide. But then they're being trained how to read their Bible, bottom left. And then they're being trained to go out and share the gospel up there at the top. We support that. It's not about us, but I just want you to be able to celebrate what God is doing. We can go to the next slide. These, these next few can't be on live stream. But you can see for yourself, it's children in a place where it's illegal to convert to Christianity, hearing the good news of Jesus. You can keep going. Same thing here. Children, teens, being loved with the love of Christ. And this is where it really gets you. Dozens of baptisms a month in a place where that's illegal. That's awesome. Is the mission happening? Yeah. Who gets the glory? God. You can go to the last one. I just had this thought in the first. So all those people were involved in the baptisms in some way. And I thought about the, the guy on the left in the first service. What if he goes out? What if he continues the mission? We can celebrate the mission that God brought the gospel to us through. And we can be thankful for the men and women who passed on faith for generation after generation after generation that allows us to be here today. And we can celebrate that that mission continues until he comes to take us home. So let's continue to celebrate and rejoice in the Lord and that our names are written in heaven. And if they're not, we can say, Jesus, are you the one? And he'll say yes. And we can follow him now and forever. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can look at the mission that you came to set us free. And that we can know that either you've done that or we can come to you and you will do it. Lord, thank you for what you're doing locally and globally and that there are people that we don't even know that we are impacting through our service and support that we'll one day see in heaven and they'll say, hey, that's why I came to faith. You were a part of that? And we can say, that's all, that's all God. Thank you, Lord. Let us humbly serve you and continue the mission for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.